Hello there, my name is Lewis Whelan, and for the last 30 years, I've been publishing the Atlanta Community Profiles magazines that are distributed by the First Multiple Listing Service of Atlanta. They are in all of the real estate brokerage firms in the metro area. They are also available in all of the three multiple listing service stores, for, and realtors pick them up and give them out to um, people moving here for business or pleasure. They're packed full of information about the area. We have profiled all the counties and the communities. The magazines are on the website for the first multiple listing service of Atlanta as well. There are roughly about 60,000 agents now and growing because FMLS, or first multiple listing service, is expanding to parts even of Puerto Rico and Florida and Alabama. And I'm told that there will be new areas of coverage coming soon. And um, I won't, I'm not at liberty to share that because it's not in my area of expertise, but we are growing, the FMLS is growing so that there'll be more listings available for commercial properties. Anyway, um, I am also a commercial realtor with KW Commercial and my area of, of involvement is multifamily land and I can help you find office space to buy or lease. My, um, my email is lewieland at kw.com, L-O-U-W-I-E-L-A-N-D at kw.com. And uh, I've been a member of the Concourse Athletic Club for about 30 years, since 1990. And I've been seeing our guest over there for many years and never really got the privilege of getting to know him, but seen him over there working out and, uh, and, uh, and finally ran into him over at the Atlanta Commercial Board of Realtors one day and introduced myself. So uh, Sam Dougherty, Sam, Sim, S-I-M, -S not Sam, Sim Dougherty at um, King Industrial Realty. Great to have you on the show and get to know you better, Sim. Thank you for taking time and coming on the show. Thanks, Lou. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. So, Sim is president of King Industrial Realty, and um, he has 40 years of experience in commercial real estate. He's won pretty much every award that, that I can think of as a commercial realtor and commercial broker. Most outstanding transaction of the year, couple year for two years, 2014 and 21, and his uh, repurposing of Shannon Mall. He's, he's a, he has the highest designation you can get among others, as a, which is a CCIM in commercial real estate. And um, has contributed articles to uh, professional publications in commercial real estate. He lives in Cobb County, and um, he's a graduate of Georgia State University, where he majored in real estate and management. So we're going to learn a lot about industrial real estate today. And um, let me start out by asking Sim to, how would you define um, industrial real estate? What is the difference between industrial real estate and commercial real estate and office real estate? Well, uh, essentially what we're doing is we're dealing mostly with warehouses, industrial warehouses. The vast majority, probably 97% of what we deal with as far as buildings go are distribution warehouses and e-commerce. E uh, the small part, maybe 3% is uh, a business service with a lot of office in it, and we also do a lot of land. And the land that you do is for, not for residential development, right? It would be for commercial development. Yeah, everything's for commercial, but uh, more specifically, uh, almost everything we do is industrial. It doesn't mean we don't do other things, but the vast majority of what we do is industrial for office, warehouse, uh, buildings. Okay, so give us a quick overview of your company and some of your outstanding achievements uh, over the years. Uh, well, first off, uh, King Industrial was started in 1980, so we've been around a while. Charlie King started it, and he actually started the first industrial uh, database for space in the Atlanta area. 
uh, and we keep it up to this day. I, I joined Charlie and King Industrial in 1992, so I've been here 30 years. Uh, became president in 2008, uh, partner in 2015. And our claim to fame is that we, because we have our own database and we keep it up ourselves, I have 25 brokers that divide up the Atlanta area and every quarter they drive by every building in every space. Massive job. But they're looking for somebody moved in, somebody moved out, uh, or new construction. Uh, they bring those books back to my research department. I have three people there that put all the information in there. And so our information is as up-to-date as anybody's could be. Uh, so we can go meet with somebody in an instant when they have a need. Um, I have six offices now. We just opened another office in Buford this year. Um, uh, and I have uh, nine of my brokers are SIORs. I'm getting ready to have another one who has applied, be 10. And that's, we have more industrial SIRs in Atlanta than anybody. Um, yeah. Yeah, you're right. Uh, Society of Industrial Office, um, uh, um, uh, excuse me, Society of Office uh, Industrial um, Brokers. And um, it's the best of the best. It's very hard to get into. Uh, there's only about 3,000 SIRs in the world. Uh, and the Atlanta chapter has, uh, I want to say 120, but that could be a little bit off. Great. Well, congratulations. I know you sent me some of your reports, which are very impressive. Are they available to anyone, or do you only give those to clients, or do you sell them, or how do you, what, what does it tell us about that? Uh, it's, it's, it's a couple of ways. Uh, one is I do have a list of bankers and developers and folks that I send them to on a quarterly basis, but we actually post them on our website. So if somebody wants to see our uh, industrial uh, reports that we do every quarter, they can just go to our website and see them. It doesn't cost anything. Okay, great. Well, that's – and your website is just kingindustrialrealty.com or what was it? Yeah, kingindustrialrealty.com. King King okay, okay, good. Um, well, things are changing out there, and um, – much to everybody's chagrin, it doesn't seem to be um, as booming next year as it's been in the last couple of years. What what does it look like from your per perch, Sim? Well, um, the industrial market has been very strong uh, lately, just like multifamily's been. Um, and so we've been kind of the sweethearts. Uh, we weren't always the sweethearts, but now everybody loves industrial. Uh, in the Atlanta market, uh, just from our reports that I sent over to you, has been extremely strong. For instance, activity for uh, the last four quarters is the third highest we've ever had with 83.6 million square feet. Absorption was the second highest we've ever had with 41.4 million square feet. And new construction was the fifth highest with 39.5 million square feet. And 80% of that was spec. The availability rate now is the lowest it's ever been at 9.3%. So there's maybe 80 to 81 million square feet available. Um, and just going into um, next year, we don't have the fourth quarter numbers yet, but I would say my guess is that we're going to set a record for positive net absorption. Uh, the previous record for a year was 42.7 million square feet. I wouldn't be surprised to see that number be 45 or 46 million of positive net absorption. So we'll see. And who knows what next year is going to hold. We can talk about, you know, all that coming up. But right now, who knows? Well, why is that happening? Why is the warehousing industry so strong and uh, absorption such so, so strong as well, not just growth but absorption? What is the key criteria, the reason for all of this activity? Yeah, I think we've been the, the beneficiary of e-commerce really has been driving that. Uh, and so uh, whereas, um, you know, Fortune 500 type companies might have been uh, working more in their retail locations, uh, I think they're now working on e-commerce. Uh, you can look at just the success that, for instance, Amazon has had over the years, um, I was at uh, an SIR conference when a, an economist, Mark Dotzer, made a, made a uh, presentation, uh, and he had studied Amazon versus retail sales in a mall. And he had uh, 
deduced from his his studies that Amazon, their total sales for a year had replaced the sales of 128 regional malls. And I was like, wow. And so when you look at uh, Home Depot, for instance, when they I toured one of their facilities, their e-commerce facilities, and they told me when I was there that the revenues for Home Depot uh, in an e-commerce facility was equal to the revenues of four or five Home Depot retail stores. So I think the industrial is benefiting from e-commerce, uh, all these companies trying to make sales to their customers and to be flexible. And I, and I also think that the companies that, that uh, use both retail and uh, e-commerce are gonna be the winners. Uh, but uh, I, I think a lot of it's being driven by e-commerce and just everybody wants it now. Everybody wants it cheaper. Um, and I think that's going to continue. It's here to stay. Well, the Savannah port is uh, adding another uh, terminal. And I guess a lot of uh, that growth is attributable to import, imports from Asia, right, and China and whatever, Japan. Do you what is that quite is that a factor in your observation as well? Uh, it is. In fact, I took my sales team down to uh, tour the Savannah Port earlier this year, um, and um, uh, Atlanta essentially is an inland port. Um, so when all those containers come in uh, to Savannah, uh, uh, CSX and Norfolk Southern have trains that run every day to Atlanta. Uh, and of course, you have uh, lots of trucks that come to Atlanta as well. Uh, and so, uh, uh, you know, they're going to continue uh, to ship to us. In fact, you know, when they were starting to have troubles on the West Coast uh, and they would have ships backed up uh, outside the port, you could at one point they had over 100 ships backed up outside the port. And instead of taking five or six hours to unload a, unload a ship, they were taking five or six days. Um, and then they also were, had uh, some of the unions were threatening to strike. And so it, it pretty much scared uh, a lot of the users into bringing a lot of the containers to the East Coast so that if they did have a strike, they wouldn't uh, be without uh, inventory. Uh, and so it's driven the, the Savannah market. And by the way, the Savannah market's done a great job. Savannah Port has done a great job of meeting that need. Uh, every year they add more and more capacity uh, and, and uh, they're, they're going to continue to. They do a great job in Savannah. Mm -hmm. I was noticing in your the uh, information that you sent over that your company has done, what, how much in, in volume? Was, was it $4 billion in the last few years? Or what was that number? I forgot. Yeah, we had. I'd have to look at it again. It, they change it every quarter, so it's, sometimes it's hard to keep up with. But typically we will do, uh, in the industrial market in Atlanta, uh, between four and 500 industrial deals a year. Uh, and last year we did like 451 deals. Uh, and so um, I don't know of anybody that does as many industrial deals as we do. Uh, and every year we just, we continue to, to, to meet those numbers. And so uh, it's just the way it was set up way back when, when Charlie started the company, we continued it. Those, those deals seem to be getting larger and larger every year. They are, too, getting, they are getting larger and, um, you know, we might do less deals this year, but they were worth more and they're larger. Um, and what's happening in the in the industrial market, um, there are roughly something like 2,700 deals done in the last four quarters. And although 77% of those were under 20,000 square feet, the 6% that were over 100,000 square feet, that was 158 deals. Well, that equated to 60 something percent of the marketplace. So uh, when you think about 158 deals that were done over 100,000 square feet, 24 of those deals were over 500,000 square feet and nine of those deals are over a million square feet. Uh, we've never seen that before. So the market's definitely getting, the deals are definitely getting bigger. Well, what's up with Amazon anyway? We keep hearing stories. What give us, bring us up to date on their cutting back on new construction, et cetera. Yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of funny. Everybody was kind of wringing their hands uh, worried about Amazon cutting back. But I look at it as a good thing because 
Amazon for the longest time was doing so much construction and expansion that, and they were paying more than anybody else to get to the front of the line. They were using between, using up between 30 and 40% of all the concrete and steel that were going into industrial buildings. Uh, with them cutting back and saying we're going to we're going to take a break from all this, it actually frees up all that capability for all these other developers and Fortune 500 companies that are, that are trying to catch up to Amazon and Home, De Home Depot and all these other folks uh, to where they can actually build their buildings. With Amazon not buying so much, the prices will probably go down and it'll probably get quicker to build buildings. So I actually look at it as a good thing that Amazon is actually out of the way so other people can kind of catch up on their e-commerce projects. You know, um, I've done some work with the South Atlanta people, and um, that I've toured some of the warehouses down there. They are gigantic, and I understand the warehouses are getting bigger and bigger, and also more and more automated. And uh, can you comment on that? What the, what is the kind of the uh, state of that aspect of the business? Well, they are getting bigger. There's two things going on here. If they can find the land to build, build big buildings, then they're going farther out to get it. Like, for instance, the Griffin exit, where Prologis is and a bunch of other folks. Um, uh, if they can't, uh, if they, if, the other part of it is they'll find land, land closer in. And in that case, they'll build whatever will fit on the land, whether it's 100,000, 200,000, 350, whatever it is, uh, they'll do that. Now, uh, as far as, um, uh, a lot of the things on the on the south side with the big buildings and all that and innovation, uh, artificial intelligence, robotics, automation um, uh, is here. It's gaining traction because uh, there's a lack there's a lack of qualified skilled workers, uh, and you're also seeing a lot of wage inflation as well. Um, and so. Uh, these these companies are trying to figure out a way to be able to meet the needs of their clients and still get the products to them. I know that Wal Walmart recently announced on the south side uh, in Union City that uh, uh, they're going to uh, uh, replace a thousand workers at their their building down there, and that building's over a million square feet uh, with automation to run the the, uh, the warehouse. Um, there is a uh, outer manufacturer that has assembly lines. Um, because he can't find enough qualified skilled labor, the next assembly line he's going to add to his operation, he's going to use robots to run that assembly line. And so the way it kind of works out is it used to be when you opened a distribution warehouse, you'd pay $13 to $15 an hour to the workers. Then Amazon opened and they started paying $18 to $22 an hour. Now they worked their people really hard though. So now when an industrial uh, warehouse opens up, uh, you might see them pay $19 an hour. Well, to, to employ these robots, they're going to pay probably $26 to $28 an hour. And the thing about robots is they're never sick. They always show up. And if they break down, they replace them. So um, uh, I think automation is here to stay. I mean, you're seeing uh, like in uh, uh, auto um, uh, plants, you know, they used to use robots to uh, lift heavy parts. Now they're using uh, robots to screw in screws. You're seeing drivers, driverless cars deliver pizza. You see Walmart testing driverless trucks at night. You're seeing drone deliveries, electric cars. And just look at Chick-fil-A. You got the drive through windows. You got McDonald's where you walk in there and you don't talk to a person. You just put in your order at a, at a uh, you know, you just hit a, uh, a button. And then gas, when's the last time you, you know, had anybody at the gas station pump your gas, right? I mean, so automations is, is here, and it's because we just can't find enough enough people. In fact, I would tell you that I was listening to an economist not long ago, and he was saying that three to four million people that were over like fifty five and older, they decided just to retire, and they're not coming back to the workforce. So you got to find a way to to run your operation if you can't find enough people. Oh, one other thing I'd tell you that I found interesting: one of the manufacturers that I met with one time said that when they were looking for skilled labor and they, they were interviewing people, 50% of the people they interviewed couldn't pass the drug test or the background check. So that is, you know, goes to show you, it's, it's not easy out there to try to find qualified labor. That problem with robots too much. I guess. <laughs> no, no, you don't. <laughs> no over, overdosing or whatever it is with the robots, that's for sure. No sick leave or 
Any yeah. of that vacation yeah. stuff and. Well, you don't have to pay benefits. That's right. So, let me ask you more. Go back to the Savannah Port Authority for a minute. You know, the back uh, during COVID, we saw these these t- trucks or these um, cargo containers just waiting outside the port to get come in and get offloaded and get onto trucks and come up uh, I-16. What is that eased at all, or, what, or where do we stand competitively with some other ports, and you know, like such as uh, L.A. in that area? It it has eased, and um, when when we were having, let's say, twenty ships, um, har- you know, uh, outside the harbor that couldn't get in yet, um, Long Beach and L.A. would have over a hundred ships out there. So our our position was always a little bit better than theirs, but also the the, the the uh, port authority uh, was very aggressive in opening up other areas where they could store containers, uh, whether it was around the port at, or other parts of, of the state where they would open up other areas. So um, uh, I think our the, the, the Savannah Port Authority has done just a fabulous job of dealing with the issues. And these issues were uh, supply chain issues also. I mean, it, it was a ripple effect of where uh, when when these uh, containers started coming in, uh, a lot of times it's because they were late and then they're all coming at the same time. And so when you went to China, for instance, and they had an issue where they couldn't get components to make uh, the products. And so that got delayed. And then they had issues with COVID, so they'd shut down plants. And so they didn't have enough people to make the products. And then they didn't have enough truck drivers to get them to the ports. And then they didn't have enough dock workers to put them on the ships. When they finally got on the ships, they got backed up at, at the U.S. harbors, because once again, we were dealing with, we didn't have enough dock workers. We didn't have enough truck drivers. Uh, and so, and it was taking longer to unload the ships. Like I was, I was talking before, it, was, it used to take them five or six hours to unload a sh- uh, container ship. Then it, now it was taking them five or six days, you know, so they could be, sh- they could be outside in the, the harbor just sitting there for, you know, 25, 30 days before they could even get in sometimes. And so, um, I think we've the, the supply chain issues are still here, but they're getting better. Um, it just it, it 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 goes from one thing to another. For instance, uh, developers are having a hard time getting air conditioners and uh, and electrical panels and transformers, that kind of thing. Uh, they weren't having that problem before, but for a lot, I just had to wait a year to get some other electrical things. So it's it's making people these delays are making people take longer to build buildings. Uh, so you're having a tough time, you know, you know, the supply chain is still an issue. Uh, but I think we'll, I think we'll figure it out and solve it. I think it'll get better as we go on. Well, I represent investors who are interested in purchase, investing in multifamily and land. What kind of opportunities exist in investing in industrial, uh, would you say, and how would that compare to some of the cap rates, et cetera, for multifamily well, uh, prior to us uh, experiencing a lot of this inflation and then the rise in interest and all that, it used to be that a developer, the investment market was extremely strong, and they were buying uh, leased up investment properties. It, used, it was at sub six, sub five, then sub four cap rates. Um, and um, what would happen is, is that the, the developers would start building a building, they'd get a tenant for it, and they'd have it sold, leased up and sold before they even finished. And then it got to the point where investors were really hungry for those investments, and they would, they would, if the developer got to the end and they'd finished the building, they still didn't have a tenant for it. Developers, I mean, the investors still wanted it, so it, they would buy it at some sort of a discount. The the developer was still making a, a lot of money, but they just weren't making as much, and the investors were buying the, the properties. Now what we're seeing is interest rates have started to rise. Cap rates haven't risen quite as quickly. And so it's quick, it's creating a negative leverage situation for investors that that you know require debt to make their purchase, right? And so those investors need debt have, start, have started to hit the the pause button. And either uh, as cap rates uh, cap rates are going to rise, which means they're going to start negotiating deals and retrading deals uh, to a a lower uh, sales price, or they're they're just not going to buy the property. Uh, the equity players still could step up and start buying, um, 
uh, but I think they'll retrade as well, but they still have the money to buy. Uh, so uh, I think the investment market is going to slow down a little bit just because you know, of inflation and interest rates going up. Uh, I will say that um, uh, just looking at interest rates right now, I know I, I got a flyer the other day from a lender that, you know, if, if you're going to be an owner-occupied uh, buyer, uh, maybe you're at 6%, uh, but what's that mean for investors? Are they going to be somewhere between 7 and 9%? You know, and so if cap rates are at four or five, that doesn't make sense, right, to somebody who needs, de needs debt. So I think that's that's going to be the biggest hurdle when we get into next year. Well, one thing, there are many differences of investing in uh, industrial versus, say, multifamily. Uh, one is uh, the cost of entry. I've majored in economics, and that's a good word I remember, <laughs> <laughs> cost of entry. And uh, with the cost of entry into industrial, it's got to be way higher. You can buy... A nice little apartment. In fact, I've got one for sale for a couple million. But if you want to invest in re res um, industrial, you have a lot more, a lot higher cost of entry. What can you comment about that? Because some, especially uh, since they're getting so much bigger, you know. No, that's true. I mean, I, you could have an you could have an industrial building that might cost a hundred million dollars. Um, and if it was a, a, a freezer cooler building, it might be $200 million. I mean, so, yeah, it's it's a big number to get in industrial, but investors will like it because instead of buying 10 or 20 investments, they can buy one. You know, it's, it's it, you know, it's just as much, it, it's, in fact, it's less work to buy one versus 10 or 20 investments, right? Because they don't have to do as much due diligence and those kind of things. And so, um uh, a lot of these REITs and all that, they, they love to have industrial because, for instance, I mean, you'll have a, a Fortune 500 company move into industrial building and sign a 15-year lease, you know, and it's triple net. I mean, so investors love that. But there are no individual investors getting into that. It's all funds, right? It's no, you, you can't really consider. What, do you, what about smaller uh, warehouses and self-storage? And what, well, how can you... How would you advise somebody who wants to get invest, you know, start investing in this business? What would they, should they just forget about it or just go to multifamily? Or, <laughs> what about well, I, I think if I was looking to invest in smaller buildings in, in industrial, I'd try to go find occupied buildings and see if I could work out some kind of, you know, sale leaseback uh, to where you could work out with the, the current owner to where, you know, maybe they want to retire in 10 or 15 years. Maybe you get them to sign a, a lease. You know, you, you pay them now and they sign a lease with you. Some along those lines. Um, uh, as far as, uh, you know, the self-storage uh, market goes, I've looked at that in the past. Very hard to get people to sell what they already own because they have a hard time replacing the income. Where are they going to put their money unless they go build another self-storage unit? So when you, I, and it's funny, I called everybody in the world that was in this, in, in the, in this, in this market. And some of them wouldn't return my calls. Some did just because they knew me and they'd done deals with me before. And they said, well, we're just calling you back to tell you that we're not going to sell. <laughs> you know, so, you know, and, and they said, we're doing you a favor because we know you and we like you, you know, that, that kind of thing. So. What about building warehouses and, um, can investors get into that can development like they can in apartment buildings or what? Uh, if I was an investor, uh, I, you, you could possibly do that where you do, do a joint venture with developers. Uh, REITs have done it in the past. Uh, life insurance companies have done it in the past. So I don't see why anybody else couldn't do it. If you put up the funds and you work out a, a way to share the profits when you're done. Uh, I just, it will allow a developer to do even more, uh, building and expansion. Uh, so I, I, I see that as a win-win for everybody. Well, on your, um, reports that you sent over to me, which I will continue to, con which I will now consult regularly as a result of the high quality of the work that you generate, which you mentioned some of the different parts of town that are growing at different rates and it looked like the uh west and uh, southwest like fulton industrial and the west part of town it seems to be growing the fastest and um that has not traditionally been the case uh, so what's going on with that yeah uh, the southwest market has been hot for the last four or five years it's just been astounding 
uh, they and they've been many times leading the way for activity and, and absorption. And um, I think part of it is that they were a little bit late to the party when development was starting. Uh, and a lot of it had to do with uh, people just hadn't figured out how to get into that market and develop. Because uh, in some cases, there's a lot of rock you have to deal with and other things. Uh, and so uh, it was a, kind of a looked over market for a while. Um, uh, but uh, once um, um, the developers and more people kept moving here and development kept going farther and farther out, uh, then Majestic and other developers figured out, you know, how, how to get over in that market and adjust their what they had to pay for the land to make it work. And so the reason why that area is doing really, really well is it's multiple reasons. But the first reason is when you're in Union City, Fairburn, in that area, you're only, you know, two, three, eight, ten miles away from 285. If you're down in Fairburn, you're 25 miles away from 285. And so your trucks are running every day back and forth. And if you're only delivering to the Atlanta market, if your round trip is 10 miles versus 50 miles, it makes a big difference in your cost. Uh, labor's been uh, very good to get there in that market as well. Uh, there's been some good uh, local incentives that could be had. Uh, and then also uh, the CSX has an intermodal yard in Fairburn and uh, Norfolk Southern has an intermodal yard in Austell. And so they're in the airports right there as well, the Atlanta airport. So, and there's two expressways, 85, 285, and then also of course I-20. So there's a lot of reasons for people to, to go to that Southwest market. Okay, the, um, well, yeah, it's a little bit off the beaten path, but one of the projects that I'm working on is trying to find parking for some of these 18 wheelers and nobody really wants to have facility. Have you had any experience with that? Um, uh, there are a number of people and I've got, I get flyers, uh, every other week from these folks that are buying, you know, five to 20 acres and they are developing, developing those sites. They're paving them, fencing them, um, and, and putting lights on them and all that for trailer park. Um, and at the moment, I think they're asking a little bit higher numbers than people really want to pay. So they haven't moved as quickly as maybe they normally would. But for instance, I think they were uh, asking somewhere in the 300 to the 350 uh, per trailer per month stage. And it's a little bit high uh, for the Atlanta market. So I think there's been a little bit pushback on the uh, uh, what's needed uh, but um, for, for trailer storage. Uh, but that's going to be a big business. I mean, I, I, I see it being successful. They just got to come to a, to a meeting of the minds of where the market is. Well, lastly, let me just ask you to take out your crystal ball and give us a little, what is your paradigm on uh, 2023 for industrial? Well, I think industrial is still going to be successful. Uh, uh, and I think uh, it'll be successful uh, at the peril of probably retail sites uh, because I think you'll see companies opening up e-commerce facilities uh, that can deliver the packages uh, quicker and at a lesser cost um, to their current customers and future customers. Um, and it'll cost less because you'll be able to replace 10 stores, 50 stores, 100 stores by doing e-commerce. And so I think uh, retail uh, might um, get a little bit uh, now, I will say the winners, I think, still are the people that incorporate retail and e-commerce into their into their uh, mix. Uh, but I think uh, e-commerce is here to stay and it's still going to keep growing. So I don't see that that stopping. Uh, I think the the issue we run into next year is the uncertainty, because like, for instance, we had two quarters of GDP of negative GDP this year. Uh, third quarter was positive. I think fourth quarter will be positive. But I think when we get into next year, we'll probably have a couple of quarters of negative, and then we'll probably wind up with a recession. Uh, because first of all, we this year we had inflation that w that exceeded nine percent. Uh, it's currently around seven percent, which is better than nine, but it's twice what it was a year or so ago. Uh, the Federal Reserve rate for inflation, the target rate for them, they're trying to hit is two percent. We're not close to that right now. Um, the uh, uh, 
So the, the way they're going to fight it is that they're going to increase they're going to increase uh, interest rates. And just this last week, uh, the Fed uh, uh, increased the the overnight rate from three point seven five to four point two five percent. That's the highest it's been in fifteen years. So and, and then you have the the current administration. Um, they were uh, using this tr- the strategic oil reserve to artificially hold down gas prices. That's not something they're going to be able to do going forward next year because they've depleted probably fifty percent of of the reserve. So that's going to stop, which means the cost of gas at the pumps going to go up. Which means if that goes up, the cost of everything that they deliver and transport, milk, eggs, everything's going to go up again. So you know we're going to see rising inflation. Uh, it'll be against us, uh, be upon us again. Um, the Fed will raise uh, interest rates to fight it, fight the new wave of inflation. Um, uh, the the Fed rate, um, but they're trying to hit two percent. I think they'll change their outlook and say they're going to try to hit a range of two or three percent because I don't think they can hit two percent. And so I think mid year the Federal Reserve will probably have their interest rates at five five and a half percent. Could go higher. Other factors that people don't talk a lot about, but they're there. The war in Ukraine. Saudi Arabia uh, lowered their um, production of oil by 2 million barrels a day. Um, and then, of course, you don't have the strategic oil reserve that you're going to count on. So I think with consumer confidence being down going into the next year um, and probably some negative GDP, and I expect interest rates to chase inflation, so they're going to go up. I, I think we'll, we'll have an announcement that mid-year we'll probably have a recession. I mean, Lou, what do you think? Absolutely. I agree with you. Everybody is um, pretty much. I talked to the head of the Atlanta Fed when he was at that CCIM luncheon the other day and invited him on the show. He's coming on in January, too. And he said that there is a coming recession and it will last all year or next year. So, yeah, I can see that. But you know what? It, it, no matter how bad it is, it won't be anything close to the capital markets meltdown that we had in 2008 and nine. Uh, that led to like four years of negative net absorption and all that. And this this recession will be shorter or milder. All the banks have money. A lot of the companies have money. Um, I think there's going to be a reset on values. Uh, I think they they got a little bit, you know, cap rates got really low and prices are really high. But I, so I think there'll be a reset, reset on values because there's going to have to be because of inflation and, and interest rates going up, right? So, but I, but I think that, you know, when we look back, when the recession is back behind us, we'll see that it maybe it's only going to be 12 months, 18 months, something like that, probably. That's what I think will happen. Yeah, that's that's what he said, too. So, Well, thanks for being on the show, Sim. I appreciate your taking time and um, giving us the gift of your time. On, and um, I'm sure our, our viewers benefited greatly. And the kingindustrialrealty.com, if you want to get some really great research on the market, um, Take a look at their website, and uh, we'll definitely hope to have you back from periodically to give us updates on what's going on with the, your sector of the market, in, in the commercial real estate market. Well, let's hope we continue to be the sweethearts. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I wish you well in that respect. I'm sure you. Thank you. I'm sure you will be. Thank you very much for watching, and have a nice day.